preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. I propose to talk tonight on the history and the literature of Judaism during the period of, of the major and the most seminal contact of all in the Hellenistic age. In order to do that, I have to talk first. My main interest is the history of ideas, as you've possibly surmised. But uh, you need a bit of historical background, and I shall be very cursory in my historical survey so that I would have more time to talk about books. The period of Jewish history between Ezra and Nehemiah and Alexander the Great is almost a total blank. We have no first-hand information whatever. We know something about the, the antecedents of this period. We know a good deal about the consequences. And the only thing we can do is to extrapolate from what went before and what went after. We know that during the Babylonian captivity, which is the 70 years from 585 to 515, there was a sort of a spiritual ferment among the Jews, particularly those by the rivers of Babylon. And uh, several things happened to Jewish doctrine. For one thing, we have traces of a kind of dualism, ultimately going back to Zoroastrianism, that is the power of light and the power of darkness with a conflict between the two. Perhaps some of you who remember the Jewish prayer book, Yoser Or of Orei Choshech, there's an effort to suppress that, that God creates both light and darkness, and they're not two independent sovereign powers. There's a great deal about angelology, which was new in Judaism, and people like Raphael and Nuziel and all the rest of them, about whom I suppose most of you know from Milton's Paradise Lost, which is their native habitat. And then part of the, according to the critical hypothesis of the composition of the Pentateuch, the document called P, which is much more systematic and much more priest-like than the J or the E, that is the systematic first day, second day, third day, etc., is usually attributed to Babylonia, Babylonian influence. Uh, people who were in exile and who returned were, as we read, the elite, the intellectual elite, the intelligentsia. When the light goes up again in the Hellenistic age after Alexander the Great, uh, Jerusalem itself seems to be what would be called in the parlance of the ancient historians a temple state, that is, a polity under the, with a religious center under the government of the high priest of that center. We find later in a good bit many times in the, in the Jewish literature of the period uh, misgivings about a Levite, of course the priests were basically Levites, being kings when it had been foretold that there would always be a king of the house of David. So there's a sort of a tension between the house of Levi and the house of David, which may have something to do with the reputation of the Maccabees in subsequent rabbinic literature. Now, uh, at the end of the fourth century, before the Common Era, Alexander moves to the east. I shan't go into Alexander at all. This is not our business, except very slightly. When he started, his motive was fairly obviously to inherit the cushy job held by Darius, which was a very opulent job. It was the best job in the world. Some people think that that was all he, that he meant to do all through his career. Other people, and I among them, think that when he had finished the conquest of the Persian kings, he did see a vision of an ecumene, one world, uh, united by a kind of brotherhood, united by something like love. At any rate, a few months before his death, at Opus in Babylonia, he had a great festival and a great sacrifice to Harmonia, which means harmony, a brotherhood. He uh, 
caused his his uh, Macedonian paladins to wear Persian clothes. He gave the Persians Macedonian clothes. He had a big marriage ceremony where Persians, where Macedonians married Persian wives, he himself marrying Roxanne. And uh, he did apparently have a notion of one world in the making. Possibly if he had lived, he might have gone to the west and conquered the conquered Italy, conquered Carthage. Europe might have been, instead of Romanized, Hellenized. This is perfectly possible uh, a thing to have happened. The world itself, to remind you of some of the things I said before, had these ecumenical ideas in the air. I cited Isocrates to you, who said a Greek was a Greek by education and not by race. Stoics had said something about everybody being members one of another, the brotherhood of men. The Epicureans talked in terms of uh, liberation from uh, sovereign powers and uh, man to man for all that. So that there was rather full of these things. Furthermore, the question of religious syncretism should come in here too. It had been the case, even before the Hellenistic age, that when a Greek went to another place, and for that matter, a man from the Near East went to another place, he accepted the gods of the new place, accepted them as more or less equal to those at home, worshipped them with no feeling of being disloyal to the home gods. Because religion was connected, with cult was connected at least, with geography. So that a Greek coming to Syria could identify the Baal Shemin with Zeus, with his own Zeus, and feel no guilt whatever in worshipping Baal Shemin according to the cult which was prescribed in a particular Syrian location. I think this is a point to remember too because we are apt to think of religious differences being perhaps more important not that religion wasn't important, but the differences were not as important as they would be if you were conceive of religion as a universal whole being uh, consistent uh, everywhere in the world. Now, the procedure, well, uh, Alexander died in 323, and in 312 or 311, his various satraps, his generals, who were governors of the various provinces, declared themselves to being independent kings. The ones that we are most concerned with are the Ptolemies in Egypt and the Seleucids, whose name was usually Antiochus, in Syria. Uh, the era of the Seleucid era begins the equivalent of 311 BC. And the th interesting there th thing there is that these monarchs did not pretend, the Ptolemies did, but did not behave as if they were native kings. They were foreign invaders and held the country as foreigners might, bringing with them Greek military uses, Greek political usages, and, uh, and using only Greek soldiers, Greek administrators, and so forth. The thing that's of interest to the history of Palestine is that Palestine itself was a bone of contention between these two great houses, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, and Palestinian history depends on the movements of these much larger, more powerful entities. The natives were much attracted to Hellenism, as I've pointed out before. The method of Hellenization was by the creation of polis, of a city, that is, creating a new town, or more usually naming an existing city by a Greek name and giving it the amenities of a Greek city, which included an ecclesia, an assembly, which include, included a gymnasium for education. Only the people who were Greeks uh, could participate in these things. Only the people who could participate in these things had any voice in the government. The movement towards Hellenization was very eager on the part of the natives, particularly the upper class natives. And we have no reason to suppose that things were any different among the Jews and among other peoples. They too were much attracted by Hellenism and uh, they too at one time actually paid to make Jerusalem itself a polis, 
under the name of Antioch, Antiochia. The uh, history itself begins for us, the detailed history, with the first book of the Maccabees. Now I propose to talk about the first book of the Maccabees as a literary phenomenon presently, but I want to say a word or two about the history it, it reflects. Uh, it is a book which you all know very well. You all know about Hanukkah and are justly proud of this gallant upsurge of human spirit, uh, throwing off the uniformity of the ancient world and causing certain particular spiritual values which the world has cherished ever since to persist. It isn't quite so simple when you read the book of Maccabees because there are two or three things. I don't want to go into this in detail, but two or three things I would remind you of. In the first place, the hostilities start with an internecine conflict for power between two aspirants to the job of high priest, both of whom apparently are fully Hellenized, each of whom bears a Greek name. That the revolution starts at Modin with Judas Mech with uh, Mattathias killing the emissary of Antiochus. And there, there's something surprising. It is apparent that the emissary of Antiochus expected not only no resistance, but perhaps even enthusiastic consent. Because if he had expected otherwise, he would not have sent an emissary, he would have sent perhaps a whole army. When the revolution itself starts, uh, you have another strange situation, uh, the question of classes within Jerusalem itself. Apparently, the aristocracy, the upper priesthood, uh, were all Hellenized. The religious people were the craftsmen and the farmers. Religion was brought in as a motif in this revolution rather apparently as a banner for consolidating nationalist sentiment rather than the other way around. It was not nationalist sentiment created to protect religion, initially at least, but rather the other way around. When the uh, pious people, the Hasidim, joined the resistance, it was then, not at the beginning, that Antiochus IV issued his decree against circumcision, against Sabbath observance, against uh, foods, unclean foods. 6,000 Hasidim, according to the book of Maccabees, had joined Judas's army. When these edicts were rescinded, they departed. They were not interested in nationalism at all. They were interested in religion. As soon as their religious scruples were safeguarded, they were perfectly willing to depart. Um, and this is the situation, roughly, that you do not get initially a, 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 a religious upsurge. The success of the revolution, ultimately, when sovereignty was won in 133, was due, I do, don't wish to belittle things, but this is the way the thing happened. It was because the Seleucid monarchy was a sort of in, in ruins, there were many, many aspirants to the throne. There were several usurpers who were claiming attention, nephews and others. And the Maccabees very cleverly used diplomacy by allying themselves first with one side and then with the other, by allying themselves with the Egyptians against the Seleucids and the Seleucids against the Egyptians. They finally achieved uh, sovereignty. As kings, apparently they were no better in a moral sense than other prince, princes in other parts of the Syrian Empire. They, well, there's very unpleasant stories about some of them. King Janai, for example, Janias executing 8,000 Pharisees by crucifixion while he and his women were disporting themselves on the temple grounds. Uh, in full view, other, other scenes of that kind. In any case, in the rabbinic literature, the Maccabees do not have a very high reputation. Judas himself, who would be the national hero, is in fact never mentioned in the Talmud at all. Uh, one other piece of 
uh, political information, and then I shall have done with this kind of politics, and I can concentrate on Pharisees and so on. The position of Rome in this mixture, in this melange, Rome itself was very reluctant initially to make provinces in the east. Rome had defeated Hannibal at Zama in 203 BC. They were exhausted and they were not interested in going east. One of the things that made them go east was the fact that Hannibal had taken refuge with Antiochus and they were afraid of Hannibal and the advice he might give Antiochus. This is Antiochus III. Antiochus III uh, tried to agitate for Greek irredenta in Greece proper, so the Romans were interested and they had to slap him down, which they did at the Battle of Magnesia, which is about 190. But Rome never made provinces in the East initially. Their, their principle was to divide and rule, to keep any single power from being so powerful that it could, that it could unite the others under it. It's always divide and rule. There's a beautiful story which is connected with the Maccabees, incidentally, anyhow, about Antiochus IV, he's the villain of the Maccabee story, who was on the point of conquering Egypt. And he was outside of Alexandria in Egypt when a Roman emissary, not an army, just a Roman emissary, came down and said, it is the will of the Senate and Roman people that you go back home without conquering Alexandria after he'd brought his big army down. The uh, Antiochus tried to uh, argue Parley with the Roman. The Roman took his staff and drew a circle in the sand around Antiochus' feet and said, it is the will of the Senate and the Roman people that you make your mind up and give me an answer before you step out of this circle. Well, Antiochus could only step out of the circle, say that he was going home and he went home. It was on his way home that he got involved with the Maccabean Revolution because he was so miffed at what had happened. Eventually, the Romans did make provinces, and in about 64, Pompey himself helped subdivide Palestine. Pompey himself, I think, was the first pagan who actually entered the Holy of Holies. Well, we'll leave the Romans off for a minute. We'll talk about intellectual climate parties in Palestine itself. Now, we all know, ultimately from Josephus, but also from the New Testament and other sources, that there were, during this so-called period of the Second Commonwealth, three major parties in Palestine. First, there were the Sadducees, who were the king's men. They were on the side of the monarchy. The monarchy, in theory, was based on a charter which was scripture. They were not very devout people. And scripture was interpreted absolutely literally. That is, an eye, for, an eye means an eye for an eye. It does not mean an, an, an equal penalty in money. Uh, this was their, their policy, their beliefs. They were apparently the aristocracy again. The party which is so much maligned in the New Testament were the Pharisees. Uh, the meaning of Pharisees has been much disputed. Uh, I hold that it means Perushim, the people who were separate, who separated themselves more or less from the monarchy, from the official government. What I'm interested in is that they were extremely liberal, extremely liberal, not hypocrites and not ritualists as they're painted to be, uh, not people who are parading their religion, but people whose liberality was based on a very latitudinarian interpretation of scripture. For example, an eye for an eye, they would say, does not mean literally that you knock a man's eye out if he's knocked someone else's out, but this is to be, uh, to be a surrogate of money, the equivalence. How much is a man worth qua slave with two eyes and how much is he worth with only one eye? When it says you shall not put a stumbling block in front of the blind, it doesn't mean literally putting a soapbox in front of a blind man walking down the street, but perhaps criminal negligence and not putting a fence around your roof would be the same thing. You see, this is a, a liberal interpretation which kept Judaism alive and kept it vital and kept it able to meet emerging conditions. 
Uh, I don't usually here name books. I don't like to advertise them, but I would in this case say that anyone who really wants to know about Pharisees and wants to understand uh, how black a picture is painted of them and how unfair this picture is in the New Testament writings should read Professor Grant, who is an ordained Anglican minister and professor of the Union Seminary, Professor Grant's little book on Pharisees, and you'll find this very, very illuminating. Third party are the Essenes. We now know a great deal about the people who settled at Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, and you know about those. And if the Qumran people were in Essenes, there was certainly an Essene-like community. These are ascetics, uh, spiritually minded, rather unworldly. Josephus, who tells us about these parties, says this one is, follows this philosophy, this one follows Stoic philosophy, the Essenes, he says, were Pythagoreans. And everybody for many years has laughed at this. And they said, well, here's Josephus trying to make his people appear as credible as possible, and therefore he's equating them with schools of philosophy among the Greeks. Uh, Josephus is a terrible liar, uh, but not unless he has some motive for lying. When you can see what his motive is, you have a right to suspect him. If he has no motive for lying, he is a perfectly respectable fellow. And I myself find an extraordinary similarity between the Manual of Discipline, which is found in several copies now among the Dead Sea writings, and the ascetic system set up by the Pythagoreans, at least close enough to justify Josephus. So that even in this sect, let alone in the others, you have a great deal of Greek influence uh, already. The, um, uh, Manual of Discipline, which, which tells about ritual baths and, and ritual meals and all of the rest of it, uh, is in itself an indication of something like uh, what the Greek influence is going to be. We're going to find that the principle in what I'm about to say is this, to keep your mind open to any innovations that come from the West, you accept them when they're attractive, together with an effort to maintain what is native to you, what you value. You would listen even to a man like St. Paul until you discover that there's a present danger to your own beliefs. But otherwise, there's a conscious effort to be even humanist. It was perfectly possible to be humanist and to be loyal until 70 uh, after the Common Era when Jerusalem fell. Now I'd like to talk a little bit in greater detail about the thought of the period and how it might have been influenced and the back and forth. And I think the key word here is normative Judaism. This is a term which, so far as I can make out, was invented by the late and very distinguished George Footmore, who was the best student of Judaism in this century, certainly the best non-Jewish student of Judaism. Normative Judaism, by normative Judaism, what we mean is this, that Judaism is a system which is consistent, continuous, uninterrupted, virtually monolithic, could change a little bit around the peripheries, around the edges, but basically it's maintained the same. Its basis is something like the Shulchan Aruch. It is some kind of codification of rabbinic practice, and it is always the same. Any deviation from normative Judaism would be heresy. This is heretical, so that any major deviation, the question is how major the deviation is. Now, the point to be made is that this is perfectly true. It remained true from the time that the Talmud was completed, or perhaps from the time that the Mishnah was completed, until today, or yesterday, or the day before. I don't know where you would put the end of it. I don't believe it has ended at all. But that to retroject it, to put it back before 70, is a historical mistake which has very wide consequences, far-ranging consequences. This was the theory of the rabbis, the doctrine of dor dor v'dor shav, every generation with its own authoritarian teachers. And these teachers not always of the same worth and the same validity. 
Yiftach Bedoro Kishmuel Bedoro. Jephthah, who was a very bad man and sacrificed his own daughter in his generation, is as good a man as Samuel is in his generation. And the assumption was that even the patriarchs observed all the minutiae of the halacha, of the religious ritual law. Uh, I think it is very important to see that this isn't so, that this is to commit an egregious historical anachronism, that it was perfectly possible, as long as there was a Jewish sovereignty, to participate fully in the life of the environment, to talk Greek, to read Greek books, to build synagogues on the Greek style and decorate them in the Greek way, to wear a Greek type of clothes, even f prepare food in Greek ways, as long as it was kosher. After 70, when there's no other way to show your loyalty to Judaism, you transform what had been a sovereignty into a way of life, dependent upon a book, which as I've said before, I think is an enormous step uh, in, in, in an important direction. And your loyalty now, you, are, you, you dispense with what normally is called nationalist loyalty. You haven't any sovereignty anymore. You transform your, your loyalty to something else, which, however, then has to be kept very rigidly pure. And the great danger to it was Greek and the Greek outlook and the Greek way of life. And I've mentioned before that when the Septuagint was made, it was welcomed, and then it, it was frowned upon. And then, because the Jews needed some way to uh, get their scripture and read Greek, you had another and much more literal translation in Aquila. The change, the dramatic change, comes with a character whose name is known to all of you. This is Yohanan ben Zakkai, who, while Rome was still under siege, according to the story, had himself spirited out of the city in a coffin and established this new kind of nationalism, if you wish to call it, a Tiberius, where people could sit around a table and f shape a form of life based on a literature, based on a book. Now, the curious thing is that in Tiberius itself, which is the locus for the academy, which made the Mishnah and so forth, you have now investigated a synagogue, and it would be impossible for you to imagine from the reports of the discussions in the academy that the inscriptions in the synagogue are all in Greek, that the name of the, names of the officials which are recorded in mosaic and otherwise are Greek, and that the decorations of the synagogue are Greek. And even in the academy itself, uh, this is the purest of the pure Judaism. If you stop and reflect, there are certain things which are absolutely characteristic of rabbinic Judaism which seem to have come out of the Greek. i give you one example. How do you find out the truth in the Talmud if you're discussing the law? Well, your technique is dialectic. It is what would be called aporia kailuses in Greek, difficulties and solutions. I propose a point you ask questions about it, you raise objections, I revise my definition, you raise others, you propose another definition, and by the process of dialectic, back and forth, we arrive at the truth. Now, the difference between this and the antecedent ways of arriving at the truth are enormous. When you read the prophets, it's thus saith the Lord. It's a harangue. We tell you what is true. We don't argue it out. I think this is extremely important, that the whole halachic system is actually a form of dialectic which had been practiced in all the Greek philosophical schools. And I think even the Midrash, now I won't insist on this too strongly, I'm just making this as a suggestion, where you take a text out of a revered scripture, some classic, and then interpret it, interpret it uh, sometimes quite fancifully, draw ethical meaning out of it, possibly ethical meaning that was not intended by the author. Sounds very much like modern criticism with six or seven levels of ambiguity and polysemous effects and so on. And this is a good description of the Midrashic technique. But you see the Greeks did that also. You might remember dialogue called the Protagoras, 
where a group of philosophers in discussion cite a poem, a much revered poem by Simonides about what is a four-square man, and you go on with that precisely as if it were a midrash. Uh, call your attention that this is a half a millennium earlier. What I mean is that by 70, when the thing had become crystallized, had become calcified, it already carried a burden of Greek influence. The same thing is true, it seems to me, of Christianity and Hellenism, because the early Christians were very angry with the Greeks. They were constantly calling them bad names. I mean, Greek is a bad thing. And it seems to an outside observer, now, this is at least ingrate because the Hellenic content in the New Testament itself is so very high. The point is that this Hellenic content had already been taken over from a Hellenized Judaism, a Hellenized Phariseeism, if you like. The Phariseeism, of course, started out, as I suggested, as a leftist movement, but it's the history of all political movements that they gradually move from the left to the center. I say that while the academy at Tiberius was functioning in one way, the synagogue apparently was functioning in another way. We have other evidence. I've mentioned to you the ruins excavated since 1932 at Dura on the Europus, where you would swear that there could not be a synagogue decorated with likenesses of human beings, and you have several hundred such in five panels around the synagogue painted around 260 of the common era in the early years of the Talmud, and you would be sure that no such thing could, be, could exist. One interesting minor point about those pictures, they aren't all very good. They are fine documents for the history of religious art. Uh, you can see at once, for example, that the mosaics in Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome are lineal descendants of these pictures. They're not they're, they're, they're traditional types of biblical figures which had become traditional in Jewish practice long before the Christians had taken them over. And one of the fascinating things about the pictures of Dura is that they arranged something like a comic book to illustrate stories in the Bible, and they do it chronologically according to the stories in the Bible. And the movement, as you would expect in biblical stories, is from right to left is from right to left. The early stories start right, as a Hebrew book would, and go on toward the left. And you look at these pictures for a while, and then something disturbs you. Because though the general movement is right to left, the orientation of individual panels is from left to right. And this is very curious indeed. This is an awkward uh, kind of painting, until you suddenly realize what probable explanation is. These pictures probably came out of an elaborate, illustrated Greek Bible, the Septuagint Bible. And the Septuagint is written in Greek from left to right as we write English, and the pictures are oriented from left to right. So each picture is oriented left to right, and then you transpose it. I want to talk more about the influence of the, of the Septuagint itself on, on, on exchanges of thought, but I would like to leave that off for a little bit later. At any rate, what we can see is that these documents, which for us enshrine what we call normative Judaism, are not by any means representing the whole story. Uh, the, uh, not only these paintings, not only synagogue decorations, not only 12 volumes full of uh, Jewish symbols, which are not acknowledged at all in rabbinic writings, which have been recently published by Professor Evan Goodenough, the late Professor Goodenough. Some of them pretty fantastic, but the total effect of all of them is convincing. Uh, the writings of Philo properly understood, as by Professor Goodenough in his By Light Light. And the fact that an author like Philo, I mentioned this before and I'll repeat it, is never mentioned in the uh, Talmudic writings at all, seems to me not to be accidental. It is impossible that he wasn't known. It would be impossible that he wouldn't be mentioned. Now, the traditional explanation of the picture of beliefs in the Hellenistic age and the intertestamentary period, in which I was brought up, and I suppose all of you, or many of you, or the elder among you were brought up, is this 
that the center for Jewish life is, of course, Palestine, that the language is Hebrew, that the religion is what we would call orthodox, and that, on the other hand, the diaspora is negligible, that the language of the diaspora, of course, is Greek, which soon came to an end, and that the religion of the diaspora is what we should call, in 19th century terms anyhow, reform. I would suggest that the picture is entirely wrong on every count. First place, as far as the predominance of Palestine is concerned. Professor Baroon, who is an elder colleague of mine, retired now in my university, has calculated in his careful history that 10% of the population in the Eastern Mediterranean, one person out of every 10, was Jewish. And there can be no doubt whatever that the diaspora in Egypt, in Persia, in the islands, in Asia Minor generally, was far, far more numerous than the small population in Palestine. You could not brush them aside. Point one. Point two about the language. Uh, even such an impeccable orthodox authority as Professor Lieberman of the Jewish Theological Seminary is perfectly ready to acknowledge that the vernacular in Palestine during the rabbinic period was Greek. Everybody could talk Greek. If they didn't talk Greek, they talked Aramaic. Hebrew was very little known. It was a learned language, very much like Latin in the Middle Ages. The people who were educated knew it, of course. They could read scripture but was not used as a daily vernacular, and Greek was. And the evidence even of the Talmudic writings, the great mass of loan words that you find there, is adequate proof of this. And this means, incidentally, if they knew Greek, that they were reading Greek literature, and particularly that they were reading Jewish literature produced in Alexandria and in Antioch that was written in Greek. And thirdly, on the basis of their orthodoxy, if they were reading these books, then there was really no great difference in their beliefs uh, from those in, in Alexandria, let's say. And it is unfair to call the Alexandrian Jews reform because they never knew that they were reform. As far as they could see, there was never any conscious movement, like the famous tray for dinner at Cincinnati or something like that, to uh, declare that we have started on a new program. If there was a new program, it, it, it developed insensibly, and it developed at no quicker pace in Alexandria and in Antioch than it did in Palestine itself. Now, I think that this is, these things are important to notice uh, because we, we, we have to see the, the, where the center of gravity is. I could say at once that I think that it, is, that it is very valuable for Judaism to have rested these many years on rabbinic writings, but I think it's lamentable that until the 19th century, no Jewish scholar paid any attention whatsoever to the representation of this larger number of Jews, and some of them quite thoughtful and some of them quite philosophic, who wrote in Greek. And what they say in Greek can sometimes be of more use to us than what the rabbis say. They were the ones who had to confront the task of deciding, of, of responding to this challenge of the new world, this first encounter with the West. And the answers that they made are good answers. They've, they've been rather permanent. At least they serve as a sort of a paradigm, as a point of departure for any new answers that can be given. And the, what they did, and they made it systematic, is that the procedure is to hold fast to what you have that is essential, but certainly not to erect a wall and shut out the rest of the world. Because even in things which have to do with religion, even I think the music in, re in religious service, uh, the style of cult and so on, I think were very largely borrowed from Greek antecedents. Uh, these are general remarks by way of introduction to the literature which is what I want to discuss the rest of this time and the next time, because this, after all, is what we can all see and what we're all concerned with. And the object is to show you, first, how much uh, a Hellenic precipitate exists in books uh, which belong to Jews, 
which are authentic, not conversionist pieces, but authentically in the mainstream of Jewish literature, and then to show you how some of the influences out of the East permeated the West. Of course, the main vehicle is the New Testament, but a good deal of pagan literature also served in the same capacity. And I shall proceed uh, chronologically. I shall start with the books where you would not expect Greek influence to have permeated, and that is the books in the Old Testament canon itself. Incidentally, my procedure is going to be first the Old Testament canon, then the Apocrypha, then the so-called Pseudepigrapha, and then the group of writings, uh, starting with the Septuagint, which uh, emanate from Alexandria and possibly from Antioch. Now, in the canon itself, there are some books, of course, the books in the canon are very date, as you all know, that is, if you accept critical hypotheses at all, that they, some of the earliest prophets, as early as the eighth century before the common era, some of the traditions on which the Pentateuch is based are very, very much older than that, but some are quite late, and they come down into Hellenistic times. And I would suppose that the most obvious case of Hellenistic influence is in Kohelet, the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, vanity of vanity, saith Kohelet, saith the preacher, vanity of vanity, is all is vanity. This is good Epicurean doctrine, perfectly good Epicurean doctrine. I examine the ways of there's a time for this and a time for that and a time for picking up stones and a time for throwing away stones and a time for weeping and a time for laughing and so on. I understand this has been made into a modern song and that all the kids are singing it. I haven't heard them, but this I hear is the case. But what is more interesting is I've looked at men's lives, I've tried everything, I've got me dances, men dances and women dances, very many, but they were no good, everything is vanity. Mainly I looked at the end of the life of man and the same end that, that comes to the life of a good man is the same end comes to the life of a bad man that makes no difference and all is vanity and so on. So you've got a book that's consistently filled with Epicurean doctrine. And not that this, this, this kind of idea was strange in the ancient Near East. There are some ancient Egyptian books, and there are some ancient Babylonian books, even Gilgamesh, when uh, the barmaid says, now what are you worrying about future life? Why don't you go home and put on a white dress and, and take your wife by the hand and have a nice walk and have a beer with me? Uh, this is all Epicurean also. But you have got here such specific echoes of Epicurean doctrine that it's just plainly impossible to think that this was not written under some influence of Epicureanism. And this, I believe, but the curious thing is that there are also some Stoic elements in that same book. And therefore, the way I would classify it is as a diatribe, one of these philosophic essays which you talk about uh, various schools together and you make it up into a book, uh, as you remember, the end of it, the end of all things is, is uh, be obedient, be a good boy, and that is all you need to know. So apparently, the old critics said that this was added on by a pietist editor to make it acceptable. I think not. I think you've got all of these ideas. I think this book is a consistent unity and almost obviously written in the Hellenistic age. Next. The next one, which I think is pretty uh, obviously Hellenistic, or Hellen influence of Hellenism, is Canticles, the Song of Songs. And I believe that the study of the imagery uh, there, even love who is bounding over the highlands, this is Eros, quite clearly. But even the techniques of poetry, the repetition of this refrain line, Smolo tachat l'roshivi minot chabkeni, his arm under my, his left arm under my head and his right embraces me. I adjure you, you daughters of Jerusalem, by the hinds, etc. And you have that repeated over and over again. There's no Hebrew poetry that has that. This is a common technique in Hellenistic love elegy. And the man who wrote this, I think this is nothing against it whatever. You write in the forms that are current in your time. And, but, you, but he has been reading. I think the remarkable thing is that the men of the great synod who included a poem like that where the name of God occurs only once and then in a combination, jealousy is like a flame shall have it, yeah, in one word, a flame of God, sexual jealousy is. 
And this is the only time that the name of God appears in the whole book. This is a thoroughly secular book, acceptable by interpretation, of course, allegorical interpretation, which has always been subjected to. Uh, you get an old King James Bible, and it will have headings about Christ and the church, are the two lovers involved, but it takes a whole lot of imagination to be able to see that. This is a secular love poem, and all honor to the men who found this a worthy expression to show the relationships between God and man, or what man is like. So I think this is pretty simple. Uh, next. Uh, one that I'd like to play with a little bit, simply because I think the argument is cute. Among the 12 prophets, the minor prophets, there's the book of Jonah. And you know about Jonah and the big whale and Nineveh and uh, all of that. Now, I myself have feel reasonably certain that that book, among others, but that one belongs in the Hellenistic age, and I'll tell you why. There was indeed a prophet named Jonah, who is mentioned in 2 Kings, who lived in the 8th century B.C., at the time when the other minor prophets, minor only because of their size, uh, lived. And that is all right. There was such a one, but he's not this fellow, because all the other 11 minor prophets, their books are in the shape of an anthology, an anthology of various harangues, like Amos, the Lord hath, uh, line hath roared, who shall not be afraid. The Lord hath spoken, who shall not prophesy. I was a shepherd, that, uh, I'm, no, I'm no prophet, no prophet's son, but a shepherd in the tender of sycamore trees, etc., etc. They're all very fine, moving, eloquent, poetic harangues, but not a story. Jonah is different. It's got moral lessons, it's got harangues, it's got prayers, but they're told as part of a story. Here was a man who lived so-and-so, and then he did so-and-so, and from there he did so-and-so, and at this point he said so-and-so. This reminds you a little bit, perhaps, of the Synoptic Gospels, which are also in the form of biographies. Now, there is a form, a recognized classical form, which even has a name, though nobody knows the name. It's not even in the dictionary. It's called an aritology. It is a biography, a sacred biography, of a gifted teacher who's profoundly concerned for the spiritual welfare of his fellow men. I mentioned one to you last week. I think it was Apollonius of Tyana. There are, of course, the synoptics. There is a life of Pythagoras, but Porphyry. There are several other pieces of the same kind. The style itself, the type of book, which is unique, would suggest to me, would convince me, might suggest to you that this too is a Hellenistic book. Uh, this brings me, and there are others, but I, I think the one that I should like to talk about most, and perhaps I won't take too much time with it now because I'll have to continue this in another installment, is the book of Job. And I think this is a central piece in my argument. Now, we don't know when Job was written, there's no internal evidence whatever. There are some one or two words which might suggest Greek origin. But the style is very ornate, very rich, highly embroidered. It is the most difficult book to read in the Old Testament. It is the most gorgeous book. I use the word gorgeous advisedly. And it is, as far as dating is concerned, we have no evidence. If you look up all of the, all of the uh, histories of biblical literature, um, let's say Robert Pfeiffer's, which I regard as the best in English, they will usually say something like 5th century, 4th century. And the argument is that we always know that we descend, let's say, from a high, elegant style like Shakespeare to something like Shaw. And this is a regular movement. You descend from Aeschylus, who is very ornate, to Euripides, who is practically vernacular. And therefore, since this is very ornate, it must be very old. I don't think the argument holds, because if you descend from Shakespeare to Shaw, you rise again to T.S. Eliot, or you rise again in, in the, to, to, to Seneca from Euripides. I don't mean that Seneca is better, but I mean he's much more ornate in style. So I think the argument from style is absolutely nil. We look at other things, and other things which are important. This is, book is unique in the Old Testament for several reasons. First place, what has to be said is not said directly, with thus saith the Lord. It's said in the form of a story, 
distributed, the argument being distributed among a cast of characters, distributed among a cast of characters who engage in a conversation in a dialectic in order to make certain views clear. More important, this is the only book in the Bible like it. They're, they're poetry books, but poetry used in this sense, this is unique. What is more unique is that God in this book is not the patron of a particular people, but an abstract and apparently universal idea. This, uh, there are a lot of people who have said this is not really a Jewish book. Well, I don't know what is a Jewish book or what isn't, uh, whether it's one written by a Jew or whether one that propagates Judaism or whether one that necessarily propagates normative Judaism, but at least this is unique. Now, where could a man have learnt to deal with a profound argument using basically a traditional story, as Job was, uh, but using the, the story out of, out of a highly respectable mythology in order to communicate a particular doctrine, a particular set of ideas, I think that uh, the only thing that they could have seen, I'm, and I myself am sure that this is the case, the man who wrote Job knew something about Greek tragedy. Many years ago, in 1916, Mr. Horace Kelly, whose name must be known to many of you, wrote a little book in which he arranged the book of Job as a Greek tragedy. His theory was that it was a repetition of Euripides and that uh, such poems as chapter 26 about where is fancy bread or the, that horse with a sense of humor who says, ha ha, um, it was copied. Uh, I think probably not. I think the idea of Greek tragedy is right. I think that a poet like this would not be so enslaved by his model as simply to copy it. It is a general idea that he's copying. Uh, rather, now, let's see what he has done with this poem. I mean, because the ideas here are important. You start out with a prologue in prose, as you doubtless remember, that God is uh, bragging about a servant Job, who is a very good man. And then Satan, who is not the Manichae Satan. I mean, he's not the power of darkness. Uh, he is not New Testament Satan. He is a member of God's suite. He is the prosecuting attorney. It's his job to bring people up for derelictions of one kind or another. And God is bragging about Job and says, have you seen a man so righteous as my friend Job? And Satan, because it's his job to do so, says, yes, why wouldn't he be righteous? Uh, he has everything in the world. He has so many thousands of camels and sons, and they prosper, and all of this happens. It's good to him. He's respected in the community. God says, very well, you can do anything you like to him, except don't hurt him. And Satan says, all right, I will. You'll see, he'll curse you to your face. Then the next scene, we have a series of messengers come in. One messenger comes in and says, there was a descent of Nabataeans, and so many of your cattle were killed, and so many of your sons were slaughtered, and there's a great wind, and so much of your property was ruined. But Satan, but Job was steadfast, and he says, the Lord has taken, given, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Another scene in heaven, God saying, you see, Satan, I told you that my friend Job was steadfast, and he is. And Satan says, well, why wouldn't he be? As long as a man's skin isn't touched, he doesn't mind losing property and family and so forth. So God says, very well. You can do anything you like with Job himself, only don't kill him. So Job has a very bad case of eczema or something like that. He's sitting outside of the city on a garbage heap with dead cats and cans around. And his wife even has said, curse God and die, why do you linger on with this? Then his three friends come, Eliphaz the Tamanite and Bildad the Shuhite and so forth and Namathite. And presently another fellow comes in named Elihu the Temanite. They're very polite. They wait there for a whole week before they say anything. Wait till Job speaks. Job curses his day, the day that he was born. And the great problem is very, very simple. Why has this thing happened to me? 
because we believe, and the friends continue to believe, that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between a man's prosperity and his character. If a man is riding around in a fine automobile, obviously he's a righteous man. Uh, if a man is suffering from eczema, obviously he's a sinful man. Because there's no flaw in the universe, God's justice is simple, goodness is rewarded. And the question of why the wicked prosper and why the righteous suffer, well, uh, they just don't, that's all. Now, the whole book is, con is concerned with this question. And the dialogue is very interesting. You start out first with uh, uh, Eliphaz, who is very polite, suggesting that he possibly, Joe possibly has sinned unwittingly, that even the angels sometimes sin. Job says that, as far as I know, I haven't sinned. If I had, I wish that my enemy had written a book. I wish that I had a bill of complaints to know what I'd done. This isn't fair to punish me unknowingly. Uh, this argument proceeds. The next speaker is a little more forthright. The third speaker actually starts calling Job names. You have turned the poor away from your door. You've looked lustfully at your neighbor's wife, and so on. Job swears a great oath of clearing and says, I've never done any of these things, so help me. And the words of Job are ended. Well, the book is a little mixed up there. Uh, another man comes in. Uh, Elihu, and he continues the argument, anticipates some of the voice out of the whirlwind argument, and uh, says God is powerful. God can do all kinds of things. Job says, yes, I know, but that's not what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about justice, not power. The fact that he's powerful doesn't make it right. And I acknowledge very freely that God is powerful. But it is just, and this is what I'm after. I've got to find out the justice of this thing. Well, you then have a revelation in the whirlwind, the voice out of the whirlwind. Where were you when the foundations of the earth were laid? Do you know about Leviathan? How long is the pregnancy of an elephant? And a lot of other questions. You don't know, do you? Well, then shut up. Uh, well, Job might have answered again. This isn't what we're talking about. I've always acknowledged you are powerful. I still want to know about justice. Well, the answer, as I see it, is something like what I was talking about the first evening, maybe with sophists. The answer, if it is a convincing answer, is simply this, that you cannot expect God to operate by human standards, that he does have a different kind of geometry, a non-Euclidean geometry. And you cannot wait and, walk, and wait for God's justice to be the same as man's and then say, well done, God. Otherwise, there's something wrong. Uh, I think that this um, God out of the machine, I'm tempted to call it, which you have in later Greek tragedy, and is always intentionally open-ended. This is a solution. Take it if you like. If you don't like, don't take it. This is one way of answering the question. And I think the restraint with which it's put, not definitely one way or the other, the only thing that's definite is that the friends are wrong. They think they've got God in their vest pocket, and they, they know his calculations perfectly. They're speaking for him. They have the arrogance of the devout. The devout are always arrogant. They're so sure about things which people cannot really be sure about. So there's your, your problem. Now, there's a great... Another problem about this piece, uh, which I think spoils everything that I've said in one way, and that is that you've taken all of this time, well, I don't know, I suppose it would take two hours to read, perhaps longer to act out in full. You've taken all of this time, you've beat us over the head to explain to us, to make it clear to us, to convince us that there's no necessary relationship between a man's fortune and his worth. That is to say, if you see a man sitting on the pile of garbage with the dead cats, you cannot at once say he must be a bad man, else he wouldn't have had this. If you see a man riding around in a Rolls Royce automobile, well, he may be a good man, there's no proof that he isn't, but also no proof that he is. He may be some kind of hood who has come by a fine car and other 
elegant property. You see, this is a simple belief, and now I'm trying to persuade you that this is so, and that you should not look for any kind of justification on the part of, of God on this basis. You don't have to explain it, because the arithmetic is different. Then you have an epilogue, and this is, this, this takes the wind out of my sails completely. Because in the epilogue, you have a lot of messengers who come in, one after the other, and bring good news. That, lo and behold, you've got new sons, you've got seven times as much of everything you had before, seven times as many camels, seven times as many sheep. You haven't got seven times as many wives. Apparently, that's not the same kind of blessing. But uh, everything else is multiplied by seven. Then the question arises to the thoughtful man, what have you been doing these last two hours? Just pulling our leg or something? Uh, I think the answer again is a dramatic answer. That we are thoughtful, the audience. We walk out of the theater thoughtfully, ready to be persuaded. You cannot, for ordinary psychological reasons, allow the audience to look around and see poor Job still sitting on the ash heap. This is just bad, you can't do that. You have to have a sop, just as you have the theory of the tragic flaw as a sop for Greek literature. Now, I would say, the reason I've gone into this, you see, even the, even, the, even the writing of the story, we know now that there was an original Job fable thousands of years old about this great legendary hero. What he has done is taken a story out of remote mythology clothed it in such a way with, with a dramatic discourse as to present a moral problem. He has done exactly with this story what Aeschylus did with the, with, with the Prometheus. I personally believe that he saw the Prometheus and was moved to, not to copy it, because this is by no means a copy, but to the same kind of enterprise. And I think that of all of the arguments I have, you may find this one at least convincing because there are doctrinaire reasons for you to hesitate about a thing like this. I think that uh, I shall not have to be apologetic when I talk about the apocryphal literature, when I talk about Ben Sira or uh, Judith or any of those books, or the books in the Pseudepigrapha, which I propose to deal with fully. I'm a little alarmed at how time has gone. Uh, I shan't have to apologize, this is obviously Greek material and this is a, a method of fusion and how, how the two strands have interwoven. But I think that if you are willing to accept this theory about Job, uh, you, you, you can see one enormous influence of an exchange. And I, I, I don't say that there aren't equally great influences in the other direction, which I'll also have to postpone till next time. But uh, I believe that this is a good place to stop because I won't talk anymore about canonical books. I'll talk next time uh, with fuller detail uh, about books that you're less familiar with, and that is the books of the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha. I have left the we we're supposed to disband at 7.30. I was told that I detained you too long last week. I will be very prompt this week, but there's still 10 minutes for questions, and I'm ready to entertain them. So far, you've only spoken about the uh, contact between the Jews and the Greeks in the post. Uh, uh, the I'm sorry, I, I, I can't hear you. Um, so far, you've only spoken about the uh, relationship between the Greeks and the Jews in the Hellenistic period. Do you believe there was any influence either way? That there was any influence or contact or even really any knowledge uh, either way uh, in the earlier period of history? Uh. I do indeed believe that there was early knowledge, and I quickly, at one of my previous lectures, said so and gave some evidence for it. The language I used, as I remember, is that this might have been a trickle and that it burst into a torrent, or it might have been a sort of a, a little fire, embers, and it burst into flame to the Hellenistic age, and that's why I mentioned it. And because it so expanded in the Hellenistic age, because it became torrential, then the confrontation uh, is more important. 
in the older period, perhaps a few people might have been affected, a few people might have known about it. Here, there was an immediate problem. Everybody had to decide what he was going to do. You'd been sheltered, you'd been insulated virtually from the West. Now you encounter the West. And since most of us have been having to live in the West for the succeeding 2,000 years, I think the answers are, are rather important. But I, I'm not limiting it, no. It, it started further back than I can imagine. And I, I thought I suggested that that might be the case last week. Influence the other way, yes. Uh, perhaps I haven't left enough time to talk about it, but I'll tell you now what I have in mind. I have in mind Stoic philosophy, a good part of it. I have in mind political theory, terribly important. Even the political theory of Rome, which is so important because it was a basis for political theory of Europe. I have in mind a book like Virgil's Aeneid, uh, which I hope to show is, to, in my judgment, certainly a transformation of the Exodus story uh, of a, a, a people providentially guided to a promised land and, and endowed with a mission which they had to carry out, and which justifies kingship, etc. Yes, there was a good deal of influence. There was a kind of influence even on love poetry, which I propose to mention also. I think that the largest single point uh, is, uh, for the West as a whole, the most immediate one, is a different concept of authority. Whereas in Athens, at any rate, you thought that the seat of legislation, the seat of power, what gave laws the power they had, was the ecclesia, was the action of the people. This was the Greek view. This was the view of the West. You did not have, you had, uh, you had a great loyalty to, I tried hard to talk about this in connection with the sophists, that you, your attitude towards the authority of, of institutions was relatively relaxed. What you were really loyal to, uh, what you did keep tenaciously, was something like style. Uh, one of the great things is, where does authority go? Well, it goes in a ruler. And the ruler is hedged about by divinity. And he becomes himself nomos emsukos, which is law incarnate. Now, this is a new set of ideas which carries with it all kinds of implications in, in, in life and society. Uh, the interesting thing is that, oh, that uh, the Hellenistic kings and after them the Roman emperors who claimed deification, the sort of a half-hearted gesture anyhow, did this to give themselves authority. If they were operating only on the basis of classical theory, they wouldn't have done it. It was ridiculous because men don't become gods. They can become heroes after they're dead, but they do not become gods in their lifetimes. Or they do not have a particular providence that guides them and, and, and endows their, their actions with a, with a kind of charismatic authority. Is there anyone else? You mentioned the political parties which existed in ancient Israel, and uh, somehow you seem to have uh, completely gone and passed by the uh, zealots and the Sakari. And there are many historians that argue that the Dead Sea Scrolls are not the work of an Essene group. Yes, this is Cecil Roth's uh, yes. argument, and, and others also. Um, I think that it's almost anachronistic to speak of them except in connection with the insurrection against Rome. And what I had in mind, to, I was very sloppy and didn't talk much about dates, but I was really talking about the early part, uh, the contemporary Maccabean period. Those are the books that I'm most concerned with, Maccabees, Judith, Ecclesiasticus, which are the earliest ones. But uh, you're quite right, and Mr. Roth may be right, I'm not saying that he is, uh, on the zealots. But this is relevant only to, to, to the insurrection against the Romans, and I was thinking of a period a little bit earlier. In one of his lectures, Professor Gaster compared the Song of Songs with an Arab 
Europe and uh, other Semitic wedding. Now mm -hmm. you compared sure. it to Greek poetry. Would you say that the that the Arab weddings are in, are influenced uh, by the Hellenistic poetry? Uh, I don't see why not. I don't think this is a peculiar privilege of the, of the Jews. Um, <laughs> The Arab poetry which uh, Dr. Gasta mentioned is considerably later in date than the Song of Songs. I mean, we haven't got any Arab poetry that's, that's this far back. We've got very, very little pre-Enlightenment, which means pre muhammad Arab poetry at all. Uh, I think this is another example of the same thing. This has usually been, it's very hard to get a structure out of the Song of Songs. It is apparently independent pieces. It is said that these have to do with the, with the, the king you see as a bridegroom. King is always, bridegroom is always a king during the week of marriage. And the imagery all has to do with matrimony, with uh, wedding ceremonies and all of that. This may be true, but you don't even have to worry about the lack of structure if you're going to make this uh, influenced by Hellenistic erotic poetry. I don't know. I, I, I cannot be sure of any of this. What I argue from is that we have things that are reminiscent, suggestive of this, in pagan Hellenistic poetry. There isn't anything remotely like it uh, in scripture. It is very hard to see any meaning for it except by symbolic interpretation, and I will assume that by the time of the, it was its inclusion in the canon, it had already been endowed with such interpretation. And incidentally, the allegorical interpretation which the rabbis practice so freely, this is inevitable. Whenever you have any sacred text, a pseudo-sacred text, ancient and revered, and it's so old that your own moral sensibilities have gone beyond the sensibilities represented in the ancient text, you must resort to allegorical interpretation. This is the basis of Philo. Uh, it says this, it does well, even, even, the, even the, the Pharisaic uh, interpretation of the laws, I, I for an eye, well, we, we are much beyond I for an eye, so we say this is, this is a, this is be turned into a money payment or something of that kind. Well, you know, this had been going on since the 6th century B.C. by the Stoics. Uh, I'm not, uh, I, I know I sound as if I was going to say that everything comes in one direction. It doesn't all come in one direction. It goes back and forth. It oscillates. It's a pendulum movement. It takes something up here, carries it over here, and drops it, and comes back after a while and takes it back changed. And this is what usually happened. All of the, all of the things that were taken over from the west to the east Let's say those things which went into Christianity came back to the West again in altered form. And this is true of a lot of other uh, cultural artifacts. I think if the time, according to this clock here, is half past, so I will say that next week I'll talk exclusively about books, and thank you very much. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.